morning. Is my microphone on? Yes, it is. A very warm welcome to all of you who've come to worship here at Blessings uh, Christian Church this morning. Uh, we're here with a very small crowd, as expected, because COVID is kind of spreading in the community, and we know that there are many members who are presently isolating or quarantining, but we can be here together this morning with a small, intimate, and very friendly group. But I know that this morning we have more people who are joining us via live stream than we typically do, so a very warm welcome to you uh, who are joining us from the comforts of your apartments and homes. It's a beautiful day. I don't know if you've had a chance to step outside, but the sun is shining brightly as we approach uh, Christmas Day. Well, my name is Bill DeYoung, and I'm the pastor at Blessings, and I'd be happy to meet with any of you who don't know me. And I don't know that we have many here in church this morning, but if you're watching online, uh, please consider sending an email to info at blessingshamilton.ca, and we will be very happy to respond to your query. In our pews, we have visitor information cards that give you several options, one of which may apply to you. Consider looking through the options on that card, and you can hand it to me or to a member of our welcome team at the conclusion of this service. Then, as per usual, at the conclusion of the service, we will have representatives from our prayer team stationed to my left, your right, by the purple banner, and they'll be happy to pray with you if you have a matter on your heart that you want to bring before the Lord. But you can also direct an email to prayer-team at blessingshamilton.ca, and that goes to members of our prayer team, and they are very happy to pray for the matters that you raise with them that you want brought to the Lord in prayer. A big reminder that we have our Christmas services approaching. Uh, Christmas Eve, we will have a service at 5 p.m., and then on Christmas Day at 10.30 a.m. So mark those dates in your calendar. Christmas Eve, a 5 p.m. service, and Christmas Day at 10.30 a.m. service. Please uh, stand for our call to worship. And we have a special Advent call to worship once again this morning, this being the fourth and final Sunday of Advent. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, rejoice greatly, shout in triumph. Our King is coming, the righteous Savior, who shall speak peace to the nations. Let's continue our worship now by singing these two Advent hymns, O Little Town of Bethlehem, and sing we the song of Emmanuel. <laughs>
Well, as we prepare to enter the courts of heaven to worship the Lord Jesus, let us lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Well, I want to preface my morning prayer of confession with a verse from Titus 3, which uh, gives us a very beautiful description of Christmas, in fact, and I want to read these words with you and have you meditate on them as we go to the Lord in prayer. Here's what Paul writes to Titus, Titus 3, verse 4, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. So the appearing of the Lord Jesus at Christmas is the appearing of the kindness and love of God, and he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. So as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we're going to appeal to that mercy and not to the righteous things that we have done. Let's uh, pray together. Our dear Lord, on this beautiful Sunday morning, we meet with you. And as we meet with you, we speak to you, and we appeal to this mercy of which we have just read. And as we think about our lives, we recognize that even though we have received so much from you, even though we have heard such good news from you, we are still faltering, bumbling sinners. And even though you have sent your son Jesus to break the power of sin, we still find in our lives the presence of sin. And we admit this morning that it's so hard for us to dismiss. And that far too often we give in to temptation Far too often we fall and fail. Far too often we transgress your commandments and break your heart. And we know this morning that you receive us into your presence and not only receive us into your presence but adopt us into your family not because of our spiritual resumes, not because of any accomplishments or achievements that we have made, but because of your tender mercy. We thank you that in your love and in your kindness, you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, to be our Savior. And as we this morning acknowledge our brokenness, as we admit our sins, help us simultaneously to cling, to grasp, to embrace the Son you sent to save us, and to recognize that in him we enjoy forgiveness because of what he did on the cross, making payment for our sin. We pray that as much as we might be convicted by our sinfulness, so may we be assured of your forgiveness and pardon. And may we all this morning who are worshiping here in person or worshiping with us online sigh, breathe a sigh of relief to know that our standing with you is secure because of what Jesus has done and that through his work you warmly embrace us. We pray that the joy of this salvation would characterize our hearts not just for this service, but throughout this whole week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tim Keller has a book uh, about Christmas titled Hidden Christmas, and I was reading it this morning, and I love this paragraph. He says in this book, it's page 77, here's the comfort. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you have done. I don't care if you've been on the paid staff of hell. 
I don't care what your background is. I don't care what deep, dark secrets are in your past. I don't care how badly you have messed up. If you repent and come to God through Jesus, not only will God accept you and work in your life, but he delights to work through people like you. What good news there is for us in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to sing in response from Psalm 89. This is all about the love of God and how the love of God will come to us through a descendant of David. And so we'll sing uh, Psalm 89, stanzas one and two. We'll stand as we sing. Well, the Gospel of Luke gives us a Christmas playlist, a series of songs that can be sung in connection with the advent and the birth of Jesus. And over the past number of weeks, we've looked at a couple of songs. We looked first in the Old Testament, in fact, at a song from Isaiah. And then we looked uh, more recently at the song of Mary. Today, we're going to look at the song of Zechariah. Christmas, we're going to look at the song of the angels, and then after Christmas, the song of Simeon. So we're going to look this morning at the song of Zechariah, and Zechariah speaks of this, uh, the rising sun who will shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, and in Isaiah 59, we get a depiction of what it means to live in darkness, and so I'm going to invite Deanna forward. And she will read Isaiah 59, 9 through 20. Okay, so Isaiah 59, starting at verse 9. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in dark and deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday we stumble, as if, we, as if we're twilight. Among the strong we are like the dead. We all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none. 
for deliverance, but it is far away. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are even with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting re revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looks and we displease that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation as his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what he has done, so he will repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From west, the people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood, and the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion for those in Jacob who repent of their sins. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's now turn to our text in the Gospel of Luke. If you have Bibles with you, you can read along in your Bibles or else read the text as it is projected above me, the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and here we find the song of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and we'll begin our reading at verse 67, and we'll read to the end at verse 79. Luke 1, beginning at verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, be speaking now to John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. This is the word of the Lord. I wonder this morning, are you expecting special guests for Christmas this year? Some of you here, I suspect, know that our oldest son lives in the U.S. and he's traveled from Louisiana to Seattle to meet up with a friend who teaches in the Pacific Northwest, and they are now driving across the country to make it back to southern Ontario. He texted us last night asking us to pray for him because they were caught in some snowstorm in Montana or some such place. But we are so excited to see him, as you would imagine. But not all visits are welcome visits, are they? On January 12, 1987, nearly 35 years ago, a police officer showed up at the front door of my parents' house to report that I, at the age of 16, was involved in a very serious accident. I was driving down Upper Paradise. I hit a patch of black ice, spun the car around, wrapped it around a telephone pole, totaled 
the vehicle, sustained injuries to my head. You say, well, that explains everything. The injuries weren't that serious, mainly just surface cuts, but I spent the night in the hospital and the morning I was released. But when my mother saw the police officer at the door, she knew that the police officer likely didn't have good news. It was an unwelcome visit. Would you like a visit from God? And would that be a welcome visit? You know, in the Bible, you read a lot, in fact, about God visiting his people. And in the Old Testament, God always visits his people to change their circumstances, either for the better or for the worse. And when God in the Old Testament comes to visit his people to change their circumstances for the worse, that verb, to visit, is often translated punish. And some of the older folk among us here this morning might remember the older translations of the third commandment, which spoke of how the Lord would visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But in the Old Testament, you would also discover that God would visit his people in order to change their circumstances for the better. So in the book of Ruth, for example, you read about how the Lord visited his people to give them food. In the book of 1 Samuel, you read about how the Lord visited Hannah in order to give her children. Well, here's the significance for us this morning. Christmas is all about God visiting his people. Now, it's not apparent in our English translations, but in the Greek text beneath our English translations, the verb visit occurs twice. It occurs in verse 68, blessed be the, the Lord, the God of Israel who has visited us. And then it occurs again near the end of the song in verse 78, the rising star will visit us from heaven. So Christmas is all about God visiting us in Jesus. And the question that we want to pose this morning is, is this a welcome visit or is this an unwelcome visit? And as we think about this text, we're going to see how God visits us in Jesus in two ways. First of all, as a powerful king, and then secondly, as a shining light. God visits us in Jesus, first as a powerful king, and then secondly, as a shining light. Now, the text begins with Zechariah doing something remarkable. Well, what remarkable thing does Zechariah do? He speaks. And you say, well, what's so remarkable about speaking? There's nothing remarkable about speaking unless you've been mute for nine months. And that was the plight of Zechariah. He had been unable to speak for approximately nine months. The angel, some of you will know the story, came to Zechariah and said, you and your wife Elizabeth, these are both elderly people at this time, you and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a child. And how did Zechariah respond to that uh, news? Well, he didn't believe it, did he? He doubted. And it's almost as if the Lord is saying, if you won't accept words, if you won't believe words, I'm going to remove the ability for you to speak them. And so Zechariah goes mute. He's unable to speak for nearly nine months. Could you imagine? Some of you may wish this were the curse that I had, right? But I think that the silence of Zechariah is actually, it's, it's literal for sure, but it's also symbolic of prophetic silence that had kind of characterized Israel now for 400 years, for four centuries. Since the time of Malachi, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel. God had been silent in this prophetic silence. And now that prophetic silence is going to end as the muteness of Zechariah ends because he opens his mouth and he prophesies. And there is now prophecy once again in Israel. What does he prophesy? Blessed be the God and Father of Israel who has 
visited us. God has visited us, and he's visited us first as a powerful king. Because Zechariah says, he has raised up a horn of salvation from the tribe of Judah, or from the house of David, rather. Now, that word horn is symbolic of strength. Our family lived for some time in Alberta, in Grand Prairie, Alberta. We would often drive to the mountains, and often when you drive into the mountains in Alberta, you see what are called bighorn sheep. And the male bighorn sheep, the rams, of course, have these massive horns that kind of protrude out of the forehead and then wrap around the ears. They can weigh on their own sometimes 30 pounds, that's how massive they are. And if you've ever watched these uh, wildlife shows, you can go on YouTube, you can see this kind of thing as well. The rams determine their place in the hierarchy, if you will, by lunging at each other, by clashing horns, and by essentially headbutting each other. Do you all know what I'm talking about? It gives me a headache just to watch this happen. Now, I never saw it live but two rams <laughs> clashing with each other with these enormous, strong horns. Well, Zechariah is saying, God has raised up for us in the house of David a horn of salvation, a powerful king. Now, it's clear that he's not talking about his own son here. He's going to talk about his own son in a moment, but his own son would be from the tribe of Levi, right? He's talking here about Jesus. Jesus is the one from the house of David. He is the horn of salvation, the powerful king. And what's the powerful king going to do? Well, he's going to rescue Israel from her enemies. And in the song, he mentions enemies twice. This is what the powerful king is going to do. Now, I have to admit that Zechariah probably envisioned the enemies as the Romans, who were presently occupying the promised land. This son is going to rescue us from the oppression of the Romans. But we know from the Bible that Jesus has come to free us from a greater enemy. He's come to free us from the slavery of sin. He's come to free us from the oppression of evil. He's come to free us from the person of the devil himself. You know, the personification of dark power and evil. Now, I think that often we think of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in terms of him offering himself on the cross as the sacrifice for sins, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We think of the coming of Christ in terms of atonement, in terms of sacrifice in terms of paying for sins as the sacrificial victim. But Zechariah wants us to know that we must also think of the coming of Christ in terms of rescuing us from our enemies. John, in 1 John chapter 3, says this, that the reason the Son of God came was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Well, what are the works of the devil? The devil wants to enslave you. The devil wants to oppress you. The devil wants to paralyze you in fear and in guilt. The devil is called Satan, and do you know what Satan means? Satan means accuser. The devil is a kind of prosecutor, always charging us with sins, always condemning us, always reminding us of the terrible things that we've done because he wants to create a wedge between us and the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. He wants to paralyze us with fear and guilt. And so the devil tries to make us out to be the greatest failures ever. The devil tries to make us out to be people who are beyond God's reach, people God could never possibly love, people unworthy of God's love, people who just might as well give up. 
He is the accuser. Now, you may hear it in my voice, but I've got a man cold. I don't wish it on anybody. Because man colds are awful. What can you do with a man cold? Nothing, right? You're powerless. And so I decided this past week to take a day off and to not do any work. I thought I would spend my time profitably, and so I watched Netflix. Anyone here heard of Netflix? That's a joke. We've all heard of Netflix, right? Well, what kind of edifying show did I watch? I watched Making a Murderer, season two. I don't know if you know the story, but Stephen Avery is in jail for the murder of Teresa Halbuck, and he's got this lawyer, Kathleen Zeller, who's uh, trying to get him out of jail. And throughout the series, she uses this wonderful legal phrase, vacate the conviction. If this can be proved or if that can be proved, the conviction can be vacated, she says. Well, at Christmas, God visits us in Jesus. He is great David's greater son who's going to rescue us from our enemies. He appeared, John says, to destroy the works of the devil. And how does he do that? Not from a throne, but from the cross. And at the cross, he dies as the sacrificial lamb to make payment for our sins to vacate the conviction, to have the charge erased from our record. And you know, the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 sees the cross as the triumph of Christ over the devil. And he says, who is it then that brings a charge against God's chosen ones. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one, Paul says. For Christ has died, and more than that, is risen, and is now also interceding at the right hand of God. The conviction has been vacated, which means now that the accuser has no accusations. The prosecutor has no charges. He is incapable of keeping us paralyzed by fear and by guilt because there are no charges against us. And I think we have to recognize what the cross means for the status of sin in our lives. Prior to the death of Christ, apart from the death of Christ, you could say that sin was a citizen in our world and in our lives with rights, but now has become an illegal alien and has no right to be in our lives because he's been dismissed and defeated by the Lord Jesus who went under the dominion of sin and death but broke the power of sin and death when he rose from the dead three days later. Sin is now an illegal alien in our lives, and yet one so difficult to deport. So God visits us in Jesus as a powerful king who rescues us from our enemies, not least the devil himself, but why? Notice what it says in verses 74 and 75 to enable us to serve him without fear. Jesus rescues us from our greatest enemies, appears to destroy the works of the devil, the accuser, so that we might serve him without fear. And this, if you read through the Christmas story, is actually a significant part of it. And you just have to read through the Christmas accounts and see how often you hear the words, do not be afraid. When the angel appears to Joseph, he says, Joseph, son of David, 
do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. When the angel appears to Zechariah, he says, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been answered. When he appears to Mary, he says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with the Lord. When the angel appears to the shepherds, he says, do not be afraid, for I bring you glad tidings of great joy for all people. Do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, because the arrival of Jesus is the arrival of a powerful king who's come to rescue us from our enemies and destroy the works of the devil, the accuser, so that we might serve him without fear. So what does it mean to live the Christmas life? Well, it means to serve God without fear in holiness, loving God, and in righteousness, loving our neighbor. But there's more to this song. God visits us in Jesus not only as a powerful king, but also as a shining light. Verse 78, the rising sun will come to us, more literally, the rising sun will visit us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Jesus is the rising sun who visits us from heaven. This is an allusion to Malachi 4, verse 2, which says, The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, or healing in its wings, as the older translations have it. Jesus pierces the darkness to help us and to heal us. Now, a shining light is painful for you if you've been living in a dark cave for weeks. And your inclination, if you've been living in the dark and you see a shining light, your inclination would be to cover yourself and hide from the light. And I want to ask you this morning, has God been shining light in your life? And have you been trying to hide from that light because the light exposes everything, doesn't it? And in John 3, we read that this is one of the responses to the light, that people run from it because they prefer to be in darkness. And you know that in the city of Hamilton, we've got all kinds of nocturnal animals roaming the streets at night. I don't know if you've ever driven through the streets of Hamilton at 2 a.m., but you see skunks and possums and raccoons. But when the sun rises, they all scurry and hide. If God didn't care about you, he would leave you in darkness. If God didn't love you, he would leave you to your own devices. If God didn't care about you, he wouldn't speak to you, and he wouldn't shine the light. But the rising sun visits us to shine light on those living in darkness to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the rising sun visits us, Zechariah says, because of the tender mercy of God. And that expression, tender mercy, in the Greek is bowels of mercy. The rising sun visits us because God is moved in his innermost being, in the deepest parts of God, his deepest affection, his deepest compassion. And the rising sun visits us not because we're so good and great and accomplished, but because we're so bad and broken. Now, as we prepare to conclude, have you ever thought of Jesus as a visitor? In a previous sermon, I quoted that line from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity that Christmas is about how the rightful king has landed in disguise. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. The house, you see, has to be cleaned for this divine visitor. In verse 76, Zechariah looks down at his son, John the Baptist, and says, You, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. 
And if Jesus is going to plant the mustard seed in the kingdom, then John is going to prepare the soil. The point is this, John must clean the house first to prepare the people for the arrival of the king. And how does he do that? Well, he summons people to admit that they're sinners and to repent and to turn from their sin. And only once people see their sin and the gravity and the seriousness of it can they recognize that Jesus is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. There are four Gospels in the New Testament. Only two of those Gospels narrate the birth of Jesus, Matthew and Luke, but all four Gospels tell us the story of John the Baptist. All four Gospels put the story of John the Baptist at the threshold of the New Testament as if to say, you can't understand what Jesus has come to do if you don't understand John the Baptist. The house must be cleaned. The way must be prepared for the arrival of this divine visitor. We must let John the Baptist clean house for us. So visits can be welcome or unwelcome. If a police officer were to show up at your door, you probably wouldn't be excited. You would probably recognize that there probably isn't good news for you. But if you were visited by a close family or a friend, you would, of course, be delighted. Well, at Christmas, God visits us in Jesus. Is this a welcome visit or an unwelcome visit? He comes as a powerful king, a horn of salvation from the house of David to destroy the works of the devil to vacate the conviction. So the accuser has no accusations. And he comes as a shining light to shine into the darkness with healing in its rays. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room as John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, the story of Christmas from one vantage point is so mundane and ordinary and earthy, a little baby in a manger. And yet with another perspective, we see that it's the arrival of a powerful king and a shining light. And Lord, what we pray for ourselves and for our family and friends and neighbors this morning is that we would prepare our hearts for this king, that we would receive and embrace this king, love this king, trust this king, and know that he has rescued us from our greatest enemies. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing together in response, all glory be to thee, most high.
testing, one, two, is it on now? Uh, we want to pray for those in our community with COVID. And um, I had uh, a call from Hank Vanderbrucken yesterday that both of his elderly parents have COVID and his father has been hospitalized and is on oxygen. And uh, I'm sure we all know of, uh, of people in the hospital now, and it's a, it's a frightening scenario, isn't it? So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to pray for uh, the world in which we live and for our own community and for people that we know who are struggling. Let's uh, pray together. Our dear Lord, it's so wonderful for us as we think about a world and a pandemic once again experiencing surges in cases and in hospitalizations to know that you sent your son Jesus to be the rising sun who comes with healing in his rays to restore what is broken, to mend what is fractured, to straighten what is crooked. And we know that through his death and resurrection, this new world has already been launched. And that there is in Jesus a human being who has broken the power of death, who has survived death and is risen. And we thank you that Jesus is the first fruits. The resurrection of Jesus is the first fruits of a great resurrection harvest. And as we think about the first coming of our Lord, we also think of his second coming when this new creation will be unveiled in all of its splendor and when we will see fully the repair of this broken cosmos, the renovation of this broken temple. Lord, this morning we pray for those who are ill. We pray for those who are struggling to breathe. Older, younger, men, women, in different parts across the globe, not least in our own city, some friends and relatives of ours. And we pray that you'd preserve them in health. We ask again for you to be present in the lives of hospital staff, doctors, nurses, caregivers, who are helping those who are languishing in this condition. We pray in particular this morning for Hank's parents, both of whom have COVID, one of whom hospitalized. And we pray that you'd restore him to health so he can return home, perhaps even for Christmas. We entrust his condition and the conditions of all those we love into your care and keeping and we pray, dear Lord, that you would help us in our own lives to be responsible citizens, to not be so preoccupied with our own rights that we have no concern for others. But give us the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was willing to forego his rights to die for others. And we pray that we might serve him without fear in holiness and in righteousness. We pray that you would walk with us in this day. We are so grateful that we could begin this new week in worship. Even in a pandemic, it always makes sense to worship you. And we pray that you would strengthen us day by day by the means you have appointed through your word and through your powerful spirit. And we pray that you would forever recast our vision away from ourselves to the Lord Jesus as the powerful king and the shining light 
we need as those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. Please receive our worship in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. You now have the opportunity to worship the Lord with your gifts. We are receiving contributions via e-transfers, and uh, you can support the deacons who distribute funds to those in our church and in our community uh, with financial need, or you can specify in your e-transfer the Anchor Association, which is a ministry to people with disabilities. Um, Send an e-transfer to deacons at blessingshamilton.ca and designate whether the money should go to the deacons or the Anchor Association. And if you're a guest with us in person or watching us online, we ask nothing of you. We're so glad you joined us for worship. Please stand for the closing benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. We're going to conclude by singing this very song we've just reflected on, the Song of Zechariah. Oh,